spend at least probably half an hour, 40, 40 minutes, depending on how many questions people have, uh, just talking about data management. Um, with the next generation technologies, um, especially with the uh, solid and alumina technologies in particular, uh, they generate a lot of data. Uh, and if you haven't had a cluster previously or never had a lot of IT, need for IT in your lab before, it can sometimes be um, a rude awakening. Uh, it certainly uh, comes to a shock um, to, to, to if, you have, if you've never done that, it certainly can be a shock as to how much is actually required. So I certainly, um, for those of you who have machines already, this will be from, this will, hopefully this is what you have. And if not, this will maybe give you a good, uh, good leverage for lobbying for more IT support. Um, so with next generation sequencing, they generate gigs of data. Um, generally, the machines out there, the solids and luminas are generating around 20 to 30 gigabases of data a run. Um, and so when you're looking at these volumes of data, how you structure your compute resources really matters. Um, one of the arguments that has to be made repeatedly um, to, to that I've had to make repeatedly uh, to people that, that perhaps don't know as much about IT is is why is it that I can go to Future Shop or wherever Best Buy and buy a you know a terabyte uh, I just put one in my own P home PC or there terabyte uh, disk for a couple of hundred dollars now um, where and then you're asking for something that's like four or five probably four times four or five times the price thousand uh, dollars for a terabyte of data why do you need you know there's often a disconnect there. Um, as to why uh, why you can get cheap storage, but to do the stuff we need for next generation sequencing, the storage needs to be a lot more expensive. And the answer to that question is actually quite simple. It comes down to scalability, reliability, and throughput. Um, you're not going to build that one terabyte disk that you buy for your home PC is probably going to last you a few years. Um, unless you take tons of tons of photographs and download tons of movies, um, but for most people, it will last years. Um, that one terabyte disk would probably last, if you're lucky, a month uh, with next generation sequencing. So scaling up, um, scaling up those one terabyte disks into an array is is not practical. Um, Getting getting reliability out of those disks is is not practical, um, and certainly getting throughput out of those disks is not practical. So these are all things that come into play. Um, so if you know if you if you're choosing compute if you're so if you're choosing compute resources for your lab if you're that that's the role that you play, um, then you're probably aware that the design and correct system architecture is going to be important. Um, for you, for you to get the most out of your system. If you're actually using the lab resources, you don't actually design it, but you primarily use it. Understanding how those compute resources are arranged and organized um, will help you get the most out of your system. Uh, as you get into more more advanced research areas or more advanced research environments, I should say. Uh, where the IT struct, why they, where the IT resources are are, are designed and architected in uh, at, a, at a higher level, uh, you often find slow storage and fast storage, and if you're trying to run your next generation sequencing analysis out off of the slow storage where there's gobs of space, well, you might have lots of space available, uh, but it's going to run really slowly. So understanding how things are structured in your home space is is important. Uh, so in this time frame that I, I have available, really, you're not going to learn a lot about computing here. But you'll understand the basics, hopefully, by in this, the basics of computing systems and how they're, how they're designed and, and the main features you need to think about. 
um, and especially in, with respect to in the context of purchasing decisions um, that are relevant. Uh, but the key thing is to talk to your local expert. Um, and if you don't have a local expert, make a, make a friend um, at, a, at a larger genome center. That's, that's the best advice that I can give you. Um, so if you don't have, if you don't know anyone at a large genome center, make friends with Francis. Uh, if you don't already know, he's not in the room, so almost. But um, uh, certainly at OICR, they have enough. Uh, they have enough expertise that they can they can help here. Uh, so the basics of any computing system um, is fourfold. It's the CPU, disk space, and RAM. Those are the three that that mostly people are aware of talk about. But then the fourth one is the is bandwidth, which is sometimes. Um, neglected, but you neglect bandwidth at your peril. Um, so, CPU obviously determines how quickly your operations execute, how quickly your computer works. Uh, in bioinformatics, most bioinformatics applications, alignment and the like, uh, assembly does not, but alignment for the most part fall, fall, fall into what's called the embarrassingly parallel category for of, of applications in that you can easily divide them up into separate pieces, run those pieces on separate compute nodes, and then just simply sum up the results, like cut all the results together at the end and create one big file, and that's it. There's, there's no interdependency between those individual processes, for the most part. Uh, there's always exceptions, but for the most part, there's no, there's no uh, uh, interdependency between those pieces. And so that means it's very easy to divide up that uh, that big data set and run it in parallel. Um, and in that environment, getting your application to run faster is just simply uh, uh, simply uh, all you need to do is add more CPUs to the system. And so this is what's led to the to the great uptake in clusters in bioinformatics in the last 10 years or so. Um, and uh, and the advantage now is that we're now moving to CPU architectures where you can get multiple cores within a single node. Um, and that's that's making clusters smaller, which is good news for us. So throughout my slide, you'll see um, either crossed out or, or sort of new text. And this is where I've updated my slides from last year. And so last year, what I, what I said in this, in this in this session was that you need around eight CPUs per sequencer um, to handle the, data, the current data rates. So I now say you actually need eight dual quad core CPUs to handle the data rates. Um, so, so that I mean that's so I'm essentially sort of up to my uh, up to my um, requirement by about by a factor of eight there. Um, that's just a consequence of the, the extra data rates that we now have available. But these sort of boxes are actually relatively easy to come by. You can go and buy them from Dell or wherever, and they will, they will have these boxes available. Um, in terms of RAM, um, RAM is important because it allows the computer to store um, instruct, uh, memory, it allows it to store information in memory that's situated very close to the CPU. Um, and so instructions can be calculated and, uh, on that. Uh, Instructions can be uh, calculation can be performed on that storage very quickly, um, and there's no delay in get a very little relatively small delay in getting that uh, data out of that space, and so that's that's um, uh, getting having enough RAM for your application is important. Um, so the typical sizing is uh, two gigabytes per CPU. So in the eight-way box that I mentioned previously, you probably want around 32 gigs of memory, and that should work fine with most aligners. Um, assemblers typically requires a lot more RAM. Um, human de novo, in particular, you probably need 96 gigs of, me of RAM or so. Um, there's there's been some development on on a light on assemblers. That uh, that use less RAM out of the group in Vancouver. There's a the Novo assembly application called Abyss, and that's distributed across the cluster and and doesn't require doesn't require um, a huge machine with lots of RAM in the way it's architected. Um, 
If you run out of RAM for your process, the computer goes into the state called swapping, where it's reading um, the reading reading the data instead of reading it from RAM or being up, up, it's reading it from disk repeatedly, and it's not able to cache any of that data from the disk in the, in the RAM. This being a relatively slow access storage space means the computer speed just just uh, goes right down, where it's limited, where its speed is limited by the disk access speed, and your CPU is essentially spending most most of its time sitting around uh, idle, and so that's where you don't want to be. You don't want just you want your process to be CPU limited, and that's why having enough RAM is important for your application. In terms of disk space, uh, unlike RAM, which is temporary in, in store in, in temporary storage and goes away whenever the, uh, the information in that space is deleted every time the machine is switched off, this space is essentially permanent. Um, but and, but the and it's a easy or cheaper, they are cheaper to create large space, large amounts of storage in this space. The downside of it is it's slower access. And so uh, there are ways to improve uh, the access time. Uh, raiding the disks allows disk information from multiple disks to be read in parallel, and that uh, improves performance. Uh, things to be aware of when you're reading from large data sets is that if you're reading from the file and you're trying to read from multiple places in that file, or trying to read through that file to find a particular piece of information, um, you'll have to seek to a particular location, even if you know where that location is. So I think yesterday BAM, BAM files were talked about, yes? Okay. So BAM files um, index the file, and so you don't need to, uh, so the advantage is you don't need to read through the whole file to find, find the read that you're interested in. But even so, even though you know where that read is located in that file, you still need to seek to that location, so the actual disk head needs to move to the location where that read is. That takes that takes time, and it's very short, usually on the order of, of, of nine milliseconds or five milliseconds or something like that. So it's relatively fast. But if you're see if you're seeking around, if you're trying to extract a million reads, and they're located all over your file, huge file, you're going to have a million seeks, and that is going to start to slow your program down. So when you're designing and thinking about how to write software, that's something that you have to bear in mind is that if you're if is to sort of think about how to do that. And so that's why often these files are sorted by genomic location so that once you find a particular position you can read through at that point. Um, and all the downstream operations benefit from that process. Um, okay, so in terms of this space, um, how much this space are we looking at? So sequences generate right now around two, gig two gigabases of data a day. You have to that's just a sequence data, so you have quality values as well. You can have anywhere from one to four quality values per, per base sequence. And then you also have the additional files, alignment files. And all in all, you, know, you can pretty much figure out this is going to mean that each machine that you have will generate around 35 terabytes of data a year. Um, and this is where, as I mentioned earlier, with the scaling of this space, it becomes important to have a system which can scale to, the, to allow for that uh, type of data. Um, so really, the, this is probably the biggest problem that's being faced today. Um, we're now looking at 500 gigabases of, 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 of for just sequence data and quality values from a single run. And so sort of the question, so sort of last year's question was, could you store images? And the answer to that, you know, the answer to that question is no. And now we're now at the rate of, should you actually store intensity values? Um, as of today, uh, NCBI still requires you to submit intensity values um, to the public database, but there is uh, this discussion taking place uh, uh, within, uh, which, is, which are being led by the sequence groups, uh, NCBI, uh, DGV, DD, 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 yeah, you got it, <laughs> DDBJ, thank you, and um, yeah. EBI, on, uh, um, on around uh, whether or not intensity values should be stored. Um, so if you have the opportunity to talk to those groups, make sure you say the answer is no. Um, the, and it, it will, it, 
there's, there's a lot of information that's, that's possible to store. Intensity values are useful if you plan to uh, recall the data. So if at some point in time there is a, if you anticipate there's going to be a new base caller um, that you that you anticipate is going to come and you want to start you want to run your data through that new base caller. Um, let's say, for example, you have a rare sample that you know you're never going to get access to again. You may want to keep around the intensity values for that for that sequence because you're never going to be, have the chance to sequence that again. And so if there's a better base caller that comes out in a year or two, you can potentially rerun it on that data and perhaps get an extra percent or two added value to that data. So while I agree you said that you should not store images for the sake of the scale that is being, and then you said we could store intensity files for the insert or waiting for the right good base color that might come in the future. But for example, in, in Illumina this time, they had a new version where the old images were clustered better, and we were able to get more reads. So my, my question is, we can also keep the images for a future better <laughs> image clustering. I mean, that's not to contradict something. Sure. Story, but do we have something better where we can compress these guys, or? I think there's some groups that are working on compression schemes. I think it's yeah, it's, it's a good it's a good point though that you raise. Um, I think it it's an really an, at some level it's obviously a very individual decision as to how much you can afford to keep. Um, I know there's places I know there's there's many genome centers that keep their data for maybe six months and then throw it away. There's other places that throw it away right away. There's places that I think if it have it all on tape um, as well, and so I think it really, it, it, I think it's, I think it's fine to do that. Uh, and that's an argument that's been made. It's, um, and at some level, that's that's probably true for things that are commonly available. Um, that is, but. Yeah, I, I guess so if you, yeah, <laughs> there's definitely, and there's definitely systems already that we have, there'll be systems in the lab where data is collected and thrown away automatically by, by the machine. Uh, right. right. Yeah, it depends on how much you want to spend and how much you think you're going to get out of data at the end of the day. And that's, that really is a very individual decision. Um, but I don't think I answered your original question, right? Which was, uh, what are there any? What was the original question? Yes, I was more interested to know any better compression techniques out there. Better compression techniques. So I've heard there's there's there's. Uh, no, I I remember. Uh, I don't think it went anywhere, but there was a group that was looking at uh, trying to turn the um, the data into like a movie. Um, and maybe you could use then use compression techniques from, from from movies. You know, they used to compress movies on the end. Potentially, you could use that. There's always data loss, right? And so then it comes. Then the oh, question becomes: question. How much data are you willing to lose in order to compress the image? Um, it's very hard to do data duplication um, in uh, other fields as well. And that's commonly used, but you know, you can you can degrade. Um, a photograph quality and and retain the basic elements quite easily, but it doesn't seem to work as well with our data. Um, so I don't. I mean, I don't have a. So I don't. I don't know of anything that's out there that that's currently being used to compress images. Um, yeah, I looked did a little bit of research into this last year, and I didn't. There's, there was nothing that was immediately applicable. 
I remember that one group looked at it. I think they they managed to get it down by. It was it was quite you know it basically they couldn't get it to be any better than GZIP. Okay. Right, and and so there was nothing special, in there was nothing inherent in the images, um, in their research there was nothing inherent in the images that they could find that would allow them to do much better than they were getting out of GZIP. Which, which to me says it's pretty much a lost cause okay. in that case. Um, so in, in, yeah, so I mean, I think I think images, you can store them if you have the space and you have the desire. Um, should you store intensities? I think right now there's there's probably some value in that. Um, but I think as we go forwards, as as base quality values become better and more stable. Uh, those algorithms become better and more stable. I don't think it's going to be as necessary, and I would argue it's probably not necessary today because you have, really what you have to ask yourself when you think about this is, are you ever going to go back to that data and reanalyze it, really honestly? Uh, <laughs> and that's really the question you have to ask. Um, so if you have a rare cancer sample, it might be worth doing that, but I've never, I've never seen. It's just never say never. I've seen data published on collation of microarray experiments, but I've never. But that was on cell files. I haven't seen anything where anyone's done this. Um, oops. So, think about it. It is. I mean, you can do it. It's your money. Um, And then you just have a central bridge that you send out samples from. Yeah. You said send people a sample rather than data. That would be more compact. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, okay. Uh, all right. Um, bandwidth. So this is bandwidth. Bandwidth is often neglected, but it's actually the most critical piece in designing uh, compute architecture that can handle this type of data. It limits the maximum transfer rate between the two points. And the two points that you're interested in primarily are going to be your CPU and, and your disk. Um, and that's really that's going to be the that's going to be the rate that's going to be the rate limiting step. And if you don't design your compute system well, then that's going to be a problem. Um, and so thinking about the algorithm, so CPU is going to process data at a particular rate. And you always want to, to optimize your architecture such that, your, uh, that you max out the CPU utilization. In other words, that your, that your processing speed is limited by your CPU speed and not by the underlying um, disk. Because usually the CPU is the most expensive component of your system. Um, and so, in order to feed the CPU at the right rate, the bandwidth to the CPU must be at least the, the, as big as the, the rate at which CPU can process the data. So, just taking through a little thought experiment, um, so if you have a liner that can process reads at X reads per second on a single CPU, which can process at, has a data rate of Y bytes a second, you can process 200 million reads. Let's say you can process 200 million reads in 10 hours. So each read of 50 bases at 10 bytes per base, which is basically gives you a bandwidth of, of 2.7 megabytes per second. But let's say you have 100 terabyte storage and connect to your CPU resource, and you design the bandwidth to be 10 megabytes per second, which gives you plenty of spare <coughs> bandwidth. Now, if you want to now if you want to complete the job in an hour, and you get permission to buy 10 more CPUs. You might think, great, that'll allow me to complete the job more quickly. But in fact, of course, what you're gonna what you're gonna end up hitting is this bandwidth limitation. So in order for those 10 CPUs to run at maximum speed, they'll need to be supplied data at a rate of 27 megabytes a second. And since our bandwidth of a connection is only 10, it's gonna be limited by that factor. So no matter how many CPUs you add to the system, it'll, it's never gonna run faster than two and a half hours. So that's why bandwidth, it's often overlooked, but it's critical. That's why storage costs so much. In order to actually have storage that can supply um, data at rates which are going to meet our, which are going to, which are going to serve out uh, data to a CPU storage at high rates, we actually need to have high storage. If you just buy your 
your data piece of your hard drive from uh, from future shop or whatever it's 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 not going to it's not going to be able to meet the needs of your cpu architecture so really the best balance of your compute resources is going to depend it's going to be application specific but aligners are the critical point here um, and they require a different balance they require a different balance but most most jobs within next generation sequencing right now are around alignment and that's the that's the major bottleneck um, and so if you have limited resources it's best to design your system around the biggest bottleneck so um, ideally you'd have different systems for different for different parts of the pipeline so if you're an assembler if you assemble if you're interested in assembly and alignment you may want to design your alignment system separately to the way in which you're designing your uh, assembly system so for your assembler you'll probably want maybe a few CPUs attached to larger memory for your liner you may want uh, lots of CPUs um, attached to your disk space with a high bandwidth but that's just a question of thinking about those sorts of a uh, aspects oh yes backing data up um, how many people here actually back up their data? Ooh, that's actually pretty good. That's better than last year. Um, it's hard. Everyone hates doing it, but it's one of those critical things. The problem with okay, how many of you are actually backing up data to disk? Okay, how many if you're backing up data to disk? Sorry, how many? So I assume presumably everyone else is backing up data to tape. Is that right? Yeah. So here's a good. How many of you? Do backup, so put your hands up if you backup data to tape. Okay, if you backup data to tape, how many of you actually go back and check those backups periodically? <laughs> so, here's, so here's the thing, uh, it depends on why you're backing up. So if you want to backup data for long-term archiving processes, don't expect that data to be intact after five years. And you may as well kiss that data goodbye. Um, it, magnetic tape has a lifespan and so Keeping it around, keeping it around, gathering dust on a shelf is not. It just, it's just making your bookshelf look like you have lots of magnetic tape on it. It's not doing anything else. Um, backing to active disk is probably the easiest way to to back up, although probably fairly expensive as well. Um, you can't take your active disk off site very easily either, um, and so there's really, I, I don't have, I don't have a beyond couple lines. I don't have a good solution for this. Um, within you know within uh, my own company, uh, we are we're looking at looking at uh, mirroring between sites. We're kind of lucky because we have multiple sites, and so that that's probably what we'll do for our for our data. But there's actually no great solutions out there. And the issue with mirroring is that you need high bandwidth between your multiple sites. Um, so there's no great solutions out there except an SNP machine, which if you've read Douglas Adams, you'll know this is a somebody else's problem machine. So it's the best way to, the best way to solve this problem. Unfortunately, right now I see I'm responsible for IT resources um, in my in my company for for my area, and so I don't have that luxury today. Um, but another way to think about these things, uh, backing up data uh, and actually even processing data, is with clouds, as Francis mentioned earlier. Um, probably the most Familiar cloud to people, the Amazon EC2 system, um, and there's been some uh, some growing interest about applying clouds to bioinformatics. Uh, the okay, sure, sorry, so I should start from the beginning. So, so a cloud, uh, a compute cloud, is a virtual system that you connect to over the internet. Um, and is, from your perspective, a virtual resource that you can send data to and that has CPUs and machines there that you can use and, 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 and access. Um, usually it's pay-as-you-go model. So let's, and, and so I'll just actually, I'll just skip out here too. So you know, for example, you can go to you can go to Amazon. This is their easy to, EC2 web page, uh, and you can sign up here. Uh, once you've once you've signed up, um, you can you get an you get an, essentially get a, a pass key, and then you can use that pass key to start up a machine on their on their virtual compute cluster. 
and you can produce your own machine image. So they have some standard images out there that you can just use. So they'll have standard Linux environments that you can just start off a machine. But you can also build your own machine. So if you have your own Linux environment, you can make an image of that and, and put it out there. Um, there's companies like BioTeam, that's a consulting company that you can that that will uh, uh, that will give you a customized solution that works on EC2. And then we've also worked with another AB specific comment. We've also worked with um, GeoSpeezer, looking at cloud solutions as well. Um, they have uh, in here. There's like all the information on price on types of machines they have. Uh, you can have as many machines as you want, up to. You can have as many machines as you want. Basically, you can get 20 easily. Just you don't have to do anything special to have 20 machines. You can reserve more if you want to, but you have to contact them to get more than that. Um, they they have they they call these things instances. You can see they have like, you can get an extra large instance with 15 gigabases of memory and uh, eight EC2 compute units, um, whatever those are. Those are actually underlined that typically each compute unit is a 1.7 gigahertz box. Um, these are all virtual machines. So they'll be running this on some other hardware, but what they provide to you is essentially a virtual machine. Um, that's their largest memory size right now, which for some bioinformatics applications is not that high. We're act they're actually planning to bring out larger, um, larger sizes in the fall as well. Um, oh, cool. And they also, I think, if you're willing to have, so it costs money. Let me just see if I can bring up. So, so storage is present on. Okay, my mouse keeps disappearing here. Their storage, they have also have this thing called simple old storage service. And it's for for our data, for our size of data, it can be fairly expensive. So to upload a terabyte of data to their system costs um, about a hundred dollars, about ten cents a gigabyte. Um, so it's about so it's a hundred dollars a terabyte. Um, now you can also FedEx things to them, and you can FedEx disk to them. But but if you have a public data set. Uh, I think they make it available for free, or they store it for free. There's also ongoing storage tasks. These things all cost money, um, but the advantage is if you don't have anything available right now, um, you can get up and running um, without. Oops. Okay, you can get up and running um, without uh, too much initial cost, um, but. Probably for the longer term, I think it's still, it's still I think the valuation of, of the cost effectiveness of a cloud type solution. I think people are still looking into that and are figuring out what makes the most sense. Question? Ah, yeah, well, that's a, <laughs> that's a great question. A really long time um, is, a, is a simple answer. Uh, try, <laughs> try, <laughs> trying to, um, like, typical, if you have a you 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 would need a really good internet connection in order to get it up in a re, in a reasonable time. It's going to take days. You know, data set up there. That's the short answer. So that's that's the limiting step. Now there are ways around that, which we're looking at. Um, at AB, sorry. This you can always FedEx. There's other ways actually as well, but I'm going to divulge those offline. Um, that you can look at for, for, for getting information up there. But it's it is it is that's a large bottleneck. I think that's the biggest bottleneck for these types of applications is uh, for cloud right now, the biggest hurdle is actually getting the data into the cloud. Um, I think longer longer term uh, where it's useful is perhaps as a storage medium for archiving, because they will keep it live um, and it will take you a while to get the data back, but presumably you're only putting stuff into archive that you're not expecting to work on actively, but this could be an option for a good option for a small lab that doesn't want to have a large initial outlay on 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 resources and want to figure out one want, wants to get comfortable with their next gen box first uh, before expanding. Um, limb systems; these are obviously a key component of of any 
um, lab, especially if you have multiple machines and are generating lots of data. Uh, limbs, you, I think, you know what, you asked me this question last year as well. Yeah, you still didn't write it. <laughs> I still didn't write it out. <laughs> uh, limbs, <laughs> limbs is a laboratory information management system. So a limbs will tell you, is a way of telling you where all your data is and what it means and what experiment it referred to and, and why you generated it in the first place. Um, there's nothing worse than going to a directory and trying to figure out what the files are in there and, and what they all mean and, and what the experiment was. So a LIMS is, or at least some type of database, um, at the very least a spreadsheet is, is important to, to keep track of the data um, and for managing where it is. But LIMS, LIMS systems uh, provide automated uh, ways of keeping track of this information. Often they have uh, barcoding, barcoded readers, so if you have uh, lots of tubes and samples, you can barcode them, and it will keep track of how they flow through the system space. Um, the database will store the location of the files and potentially also where the sample is in a, in a particular fridge. Um, and yeah, if you're running uh, multiple machines, you definitely want uh, something like this. Um, other software, uh, you can get, there's a lot of commercial systems, there's also systems that are, that are free out there. Um, talk, sometimes in places there's a reluctance to use existing solutions, um, commercial or otherwise, but it's really a question of where you want to spend your time. Uh, you know, if you're a bioinformatician, maybe this is something that you're actively interested in. Um, but there is a lot of free stuff out there, so if you don't want to spend your time developing a method, you can probably find something that does 90% 90, 90 of what you want to do. And for the other 10%, uh, you may be able to start up a collaboration with that lab, or if it's a company, get them, persuade them to be able to, to modify their product um, to, to meet your specific needs. So, so I, you know, I'd encourage you, obviously, to look at other off-the-shelf solutions. Excuse me a second. <coughs> you want to edit that too? Um, so standards. So there are emerging standards in, in this space, which is really good news, I think, for the most part. Um, sequence standards um, was involved in a sequence standard uh, called SRF for, uh, for sequence from next-gen data. I think eventually that will be replaced by another sequence standard. It's, it was developed in the early days of sequencing where we didn't really know what was what we were going to want to store longer term. Um, and I think there's now slimmer, meaner, faster, leaner ways to, to do things now we know more about the data. Um, but there are sequences around, stand, uh, around standards around sequencing, alignments, uh, SAM and BAM were introduced yesterday and that's, uh, that's been very strongly adopted um, in the community for storing uh, alignments. Um, yet to come is the iteration of that for uh, assemblies and then from that um, relationship between a genome sequence of an individual and a consensus reference genome. Um, annotation standards are there but how they apply to next gen data is there's still some work being done in that area and then as we move into the clinical space there's a lot of other things to think about as well. And so standards, really the, the most, I think the critical point for this group is that standards um, are important to support because what they allow us to do is just focus on the science. Um, if everyone's writing to the common standard, uh, then all the tools that are generated are working off that common standard, you don't have to worry about writing blue code. You know that the output of one program is going to feed into the app, it's going to be the input of the other and um, it just works. Um, if, if a lot of people have written, I mean, I don't know, I, I, this is becoming an older question, hopefully no longer uh, as much a problem now as it was when I was writing my PhD, uh, but pretty much at one time every bioinformatician in the world had written a blast parser. Um, it's less of a problem now with the emergence of Biopearl and, and, and things like that, but having a standard output format would mean that multiple aligners would all write to the same standard. And so BAM, SAM, I'd say, so go out there and support BAM and SAM and BAM. Um, and we're certainly doing that within, within AB. Um, and if you build it, will they, will they come? I guess that's the other question around standards, is that you never really know if a standard is how 
the standard adoption is going to take off or not. Um, but you often have to just put these things out there and see if they work. So I'd encourage you to support standards if you're interested in them. Um, they're never going to win you a Nobel Prize, but they are an important part of getting, getting the work done. And that's where I'm going to leave it. So thanks a lot.